the Medical School HQ Podcast, session number 51. Hello and welcome back to the Medical School HQ Podcast. This is the place to learn how to excel as a pre-med student, learn what it takes to survive medical school, and turn your dreams of becoming a physician into reality. We're bringing you the most unbiased, honest, and up-to-date information available online today. My name is Ryan Gray, and as always, I am the host of the podcast. Thank you very much for joining us today. If this is your first time joining us, welcome. If you're a repeat customer, thanks for joining us again. Today, we're going to dip our toes into the warm waters of the Caribbean and talk to a third-year medical student who's currently at American University of the Caribbean School of Medicine in St. Martin. Jared Weinstock talks to us about his path to medical school and how he had no clue medical schools existed in the Caribbean before a classmate during his post program suggested he apply there. But first, this podcast is brought to you by the Academy at Medical School Headquarters, an online membership site for helping you through the pre-med process. With monthly office hours, webinars, and a growing library of video and audio interviews and courses, it is a vital tool to help you get into and through medical school. Just go to jointheacademy.net for more information. And by the way, if you're already a member, be sure to check out the newest specialty series interview that was just posted about otolaryngology, also known as ENT. I also want to give a shout out to the one person that left us an awesome five-star rating and review this week. Josh Premed said, we'll probably single-handedly solve the looming physician shortage. I don't know about that, Josh, but I appreciate the kind words. We start off the interview with Jared by talking about how he started his path to medicine. Okay, so it's quite a story. I mean, I started at the University of Scranton. I was a biochemistry major, and I ended up minoring in Spanish just because, you know, I have an interest too in languages, and I took some courses in that area as well. So, you know, over the course of four years, I did the traditional pre-med stuff. You know, I was in the different organizations. I did research, and, you know, of course was in all the science courses as a biochemistry major. So it was definitely, you know, quite a load, especially biochemistry. I mean, it's very, very intense. So it was definitely a lot of work. And on top of all of that, I had a job on the side working in the pharmacy where my father works. And I got a great amount of experience with different drugs and learning that. That was just part time. And, you know, when the time came to take the MCAT, you know, my 21 naive self, you know, I told said to myself, you know, I think I know what I'm doing. You know, I, I'm going to study for it, you know, but I don't think I need to put too much effort into it. I mean, it's the MCAT, you know, I'll take it and it's just how it's going to be. So I took the MCAT the first time and received my score and it was a 19. That was my first score I received on the MCAT. Did you take any practice tests prior to that? I took two practice tests, thought that was more than enough. You know, I think the practice test, I actually scored a little bit higher than that. Okay. On the practice test. But I remember getting my score back. The highest I did get was in the physics and the chemistry part, but everything else was, you know, very low biology and the organic chemistry and then the verbal part. So I took these results to my pre med advisor, who everyone had warned me of, saying she was, you know, scary, you know, wait until you meet her, this and that. So I went to her and, you know, sat down in her office. And this was like maybe two weeks or so after I took the MCAT, and I'll never forget what she said to me. She looked me straight in the eyes, and she told me, Jared, this MCAT is the gatekeeper. And to this day, I'm telling you, that has resonated in my head, you know, especially when it came time for me to just recently take USMLE Step 1, which, again, you know, coming looking into residency, that is also the gatekeeper. It's another gatekeeper, one of them. Yeah. yeah. But would you agree with her that the MCAT is a gatekeeper? Oh, Absolutely. Okay, so and I tell everybody now, you know, if you're going into medicine and you have your heart and soul into it, study for this MCAT. It really is the gatekeeper. So let me go back to your reasoning for only taking two practice tests and kind of winging it. And I've had another student on and 
she talked about that same thing and she struggled a lot with it. And that was Martini, also known now as Med School Queen on Twitter. And she had that same kind of mentality of, oh, I'm a good student. I've done well in college. I have a good GPA. It's just another test. Is that the same mentality that you had going into it? I absolutely agree. You know, I felt like I had a good grasp on the material that I had learned in college up to that point anyway. And I felt like the stuff I was reviewing in the different review books, I felt like, oh, you know, this is coming to me. You know, I could just jump right into this and two practice tests, that's more than enough. Okay. And I'm trying to pull up that interview so I can just tell people listening which interview that was. And that was episode 34. So for those of you listening that want to hear that story as well with the Martini, it's medicalschoolhq.net slash 34. So obviously, looking back on it, you didn't prepare as well as you should have. Absolutely. But before we get into what you're doing now, I just want to talk about your support that you had back then. And Maybe why didn't you know that the MCAT was such a big deal, such a different test? Because I think we were talking before, you were talking about how the University of Scranton has a huge pre-med program, right? Yes. So I would assume you were involved with some pre-med clubs or organizations. Correct. Where did that information miss you? Honestly, I'm telling you, I really do think it definitely has to do with maturity. And yeah, everyone was telling me, this is a very important test. I'd even heard the pre-med advisor at these different meetings talk about and stress the fact that the MCAT is so important. You know, you have to take a class. You know, I would walk through the student common area and I would see my fellow students who are in my biochemistry classes studying for this nonstop. And it never really faced me. I just, you know, I'm telling you, I really do think I was immature at the time naive, and I felt like, you know, I was going to have no problem with this. Okay. All right. So you took the test. You got a 19. Yes. Obviously not a great score. No. Where did you go from there? So from there, this was a summer after I had taken. So this was a summer. I took the test in June, met with my pre-med advisor that summer, and then I was in the process that summer of applying to medical schools. So she had told me not to even waste my time applying to MD schools Possibly a DO school or two would interview me, but she told me I needed to retake this MCAT if I wanted to pursue MD or, you know, just get more interviews and more of a selection at different schools that I've applied to. So with that being said, I just went ahead and applied to MD schools and DO schools. I applied to so many of them. And I'll never forget, I had friends and colleagues getting their interviews that fall. I was getting rejection letters left and right. And finally, in March, I received one interview from PCOM in Philadelphia. And I went to this interview. I was like, wow, this is great. You know, see, I got an interview, you know, 19, whatever, you know, maybe they like my GPA or something stood out. And what was your what, GPA? My GPA was a 3.7. Okay. And that was overall cumulative. So I'd gone to this interview you know, very nervous. This was my only interview that I'd received. It was late in the season too. It was March. I'd almost lost hope at that point that I was going to even receive anything. And, you know, the interview went well, but I was rejected and I assumed it was because of the MCAT, just like my pre-med advisor had said. So once again, I was back to study mode, studying for this MCAT. Did I put more of an effort into it? Yes. Could I put a lot more into it? Absolutely. You stated earlier that you worked Yes. Do you think working was a hindrance to you you studying, or do you think it was just general bad study habits? You would rather go out and have fun because it's college, or it, was work the the problem? If I did have to go back and read you everything, I would have done it exactly how I did it for USMLE Step One. Nothing was standing in my way. Okay. I had no job. I had nothing, no other activities at that time. Those six to eight weeks I prepared for the step one exam, this is what I should have done for the MCAT. Okay. And make studying your job. Absolutely. Okay. It's that's, the gatekeeper. That's solid advice. It's the gatekeeper. <laughs> <laughs> that's a new hashtag. It's right. the gatekeeper. Okay. So you got one interview. You got rejected. Where did you go from there? 
So from there, you know, so now at this time I was graduating college, obviously got rejected from all the schools I had applied to. So I took the MCAT again that summer and I brought my score up to a 22. Rocking. So, yeah, yeah, so I went up a little bit. Of course, nothing spectacular. Pre-med advisor was still very unhappy with that score, told me, Jerry, do you have to retake it again? But in the meantime, you know, I was in another application cycle. So I had this whole year off. So I decided to work at the pharmacy for a full year, you know, full time, not with my father, but this was at a separate pharmacy from him. And, you know, it was a great experience. You know, I felt like if I'm going to work, I should do something medically related. I liked research a little bit in college, was not interested in doing something like that during the full year that I had off. So I spent the full year working in this pharmacy. And I was lucky enough to have this boss who I ended up traveling with her and another coworker of mine. And I call it the trip of a lifetime because we spent three weeks over in Europe and I got to see so much. And it was my first time ever traveling by myself and just being able to explore and see a lot of things. So that year basically, you know, opened myself to different things and I was able to explore and it just broadened my horizons. It matured myself a lot over that course of the year. And then I took the MCAT again that following summer because I did not receive any interviews that entire year. I was rejected. So I took the MCAT again. And at that time, I told myself, I'm not going to work another year so I ended up doing a post back program in the biomedical sciences at PCOM, which is a DO school, hoping that that would be the back door for me to get into medical school. Okay. And so you joined the post back program, and you said you took the MCAT a, th- a third time. Yes. So you went 19, 22. What was number three? 25. 25. So we're inching up. <laughs> we're inching up. Yes, we were moving up. Thank and... You. All along the way, were your study habits getting better or were you just kind of doing the same thing and hoping for a better result? Well, the third time around, at this point, I was out of school and I spent a lot more time doing practice exams. And I told myself after, you know, I saw the difference in, you know, how well I was doing on these practice exams, even though they were very time consuming. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, you're training your mind to see these questions and to know what to expect. And especially when you time yourself on them too. Yeah. So that definitely helped. Could I have done a little bit more? Absolutely. When you took the practice test, you timed yourself. So you sat down and took it like a real test yes. and said, okay, I only have 65 minutes for this section. And right. at 65 minutes, you put your pencil down. When you were done with that test, did you thoroughly go back and review all the questions and figure out why you missed it? And was it a dumb mistake or was it just materially you didn't know yet? Did you go back and do that or did you just pound one out after another? No, I would actually review the whole test that same day, but I would take some time in between from when I took it to when I reviewed it. But I do feel like when I did come back to review it, it was in haste. Like I was really rushing through the review part, just basically going through, I was reading the explanations, but very, I was just scanning through them. So it wasn't, you know, I could have put a lot more time into that for sure. Okay. All right. So you go through your post back program or we won't really cover that. We've covered post back a lot. And you took the MCAT again after the post back program. Yes. Okay. And what'd you get then? 26. All right. And that was where it stopped. (laughs) Okay. So 26 was your ceiling. You applied to school again. Yes. And got another interview. Now, at this time, so I had ended post-bac. And this is when I had met this colleague that I was going to school with in post-bac. And, you know, in September, during the post-bac program, I become friends with her. And she made a comment to me saying that I should look into the Caribbean medical schools, because she had been accepted to the American University of the Caribbean, but had postponed her acceptance simply because she was trying to get into medical school in the United States. And she was hoping this DO program, the post-bac program we were in, would get her into the DO program. So, you know, it was September. I was just starting the post-bac program. So I figured, you know, let me see what happens here. They called it the back door, you know, hopefully I'll see what happens. And I did get interviewed by PCOM because I met all the requirements, except the MCAT was one point shy, but I figured they'd overlook that. So I had the interview. It was a very quick interview. I felt good, great leaving it. Let me ask you real quick. What do you mean by the MCAT was one point shy? They had requirements set. I think they actually wanted a 26 on the MCAT. 
okay. the school. And I was literally one point shy and they would not overlook this at all. And this was before you got your 26? Yes. Okay. Because then I took, this is when I took, I took the lamb cut the last time when okay. I got accepted to AUC. So the, the double AMC has a lot of your money from all these MCATs. Oh, absolutely. Between the practice exams and the mm-hmm. MCAT itself, <laughs> you're making a fortune off me. All right. So you'd mentioned this colleague that you were in post back with. She's the one that first introduced you to the Caribbean medical schools. This is the, what I really want to talk about because we had talked earlier before we hit record that you really didn't even know much about Caribbean medical schools. Your pre-med advisor never told you about pre-Caribbean medical schools. So what happened in your brain when she said, oh, go to the Caribbean? Well, when she said that at first in September, you know, I was hoping and I had assumed that I was going to be spending my next four years in Philadelphia at PCOM. So I was very hesitant. But of course, the Caribbean registered in my mind as something great, you know, like a possibility But at the time, I just wanted to wait and see what would happen. But once I got rejected from PCOM in April, she told me again, this colleague, she said, Jared, I really do think you should apply to AUC. And, you know, I went ahead with the application and I filled it out and I sent it in. And from there, I told myself, if I get into this school, I am going. (laughs) I'm putting my heart and soul into this and I'm doing this because this is my dream. And I refuse to give up because of a score. Yeah. Did you do any research before you threw that application down or did you just go, she said AUC, so that's where I'm going to apply? I mean, of course, I looked on their website and I explored (laughs) that area again, but I never even compared it to other Caribbean medical schools or looked into anything in the Caribbean. Did you even know there were other Caribbean medical schools? She had told me there were a couple other ones and she had told me, you know, the top three, top four, whatever, but I had never looked into it prior to that. Okay. So you applied and... What happened? So I applied, okay, so I applied, sent my application in April, and immediately I received a call from an advisor who, you know, was linked up to me and was going to help me through the whole application process. And he told me, he's like, you know, Jared, I really do think, you know, you should take the MCAT again and increase that score. So I did. I took the MCAT, and that's when I got the 26. And he said, this is perfect, you know, I'm going to take this into the admissions committee, and we're going to hear back. This was now, we're talking like late summer. So this was now almost August. So you have to remember the Caribbean schools accept people year round. So they start September, January, and May. So I was getting very, very close to the September class. Yeah. And so for those listening that might not understand that quote unquote normal, U.S. medical schools all start around August, normal kind of school year calendar. Caribbean medical schools, and maybe we can talk a little bit about it later, Caribbean medical schools typically have three or four different semesters where they'll start students. And so that's what you're talking about. You started a little bit later than the normal time frame. Well, no, I actually, I ended up starting September. So the traditional okay. you know, time that other you know schools in the U.S. would start. And that's what I really wanted to do. But when he had called me in August with my acceptance, I literally had 10 days to prepare myself and move to the Caribbean. So now we're talking, you know, over 3,000 miles away on an island I had never been to in the middle of the Caribbean. You know, I never even heard of this island before, didn't know what I was getting myself into. But this advisor had given me such reassurance that he had other students who had moved there within 10 days. And he told me I could do it if I wanted to. And I said, absolutely. So I picked up and I was on that island within a few days of the semester beginning in September. That sounds crazy to me. (laughs) Well, (laughs) absolutely. But you did it. That's just crazy. What about like school loans? Did you look into that in that 10 day window? How did you figure out how you were going to pay for all of this? I had everything taken care of within those 10 days. I'm telling you how to finance the education in terms of all my health forms that I needed to get into. I mean, I'm telling you, it was those 10 days were so intense that I felt like I needed a vacation (laughs) just after doing all that and getting myself down to school. But I did it. And honestly, I really don't know how I did it looking back, but I did it. Okay. And we won't go into it a lot, but for financing, I'm assuming you got U.S. federally backed student loans. Yes. Like a medical student here would. Correct. Okay. And a lot of people listening might not know that, but some of the Caribbean medical schools, if they're accredited properly, will uh, 
the U.S. government will give you loans to go there. So, all right, good for you. You got down there in 10 days. That's awesome. Let's get into the nitty gritty of a Caribbean medical school. So you land on the island and St. Martin, if you, you haven't seen, landing at that airport is, is one of the craziest runways. If you Google like crazy approaches for runways, St. Martin is typically number one because yes. people stand like 10 feet under the plane when it lands. You get there. What was it like with all the other students? Were they mostly American students? What was the, the population like? I'll tell you what. I really didn't know what to expect in terms of that. And I was very comforted by the fact that I was going to know this girl that I'd gone to post back with, as well as two other people from my post back program, who oh, wow. she also convinced to go down there as well. <laughs> so I, had, I feel like I had, I felt like Did I she get a support. kickback? And that's what I told her. And I still, <laughs> I'm telling you, I give her credit to this day. I tell all the people, this is how I got there. I mean, I'm not going to make a story up about it. Yeah. So anyway, I get to this island, you know, comforted by the fact that I knew other people, but at the same time, wondering what the rest of the crowd was going to be like. And you know what? The people I met there were like down to earth people. You know, they were from all over the United States. I think I met people from almost every state. And there were about 200 of us starting out. And the school provided us with a lot of, you know, social functions and ways to meet each other. And, you know, of course, we're in class together all day long as well. So it definitely gave us a lot of opportunity. Is class on the beach or do they actually have buildings for you guys? (laughs) No, the school, honestly, we just, they just built a brand new building and it's like top of the line down there. Of course, I left right before it was about to open, (laughs) but the building I was in, I mean, it was fully functional. I mean, we had typical lecture halls, you know, the anatomy lab, you know, the whole nine yards. So it was a typical medical school building. Okay. So... Walk us through your first two years there, almost two years, and and explain that kind of breakdown between going to the island to do all the kind of classroom stuff and then leaving the island. Okay, absolutely. So American University of the Caribbean is set up on a five-semester basic science program. So you get there and, you know, your first four semesters are basically all basic science oriented. So you're taking all the, your typical classes, you know, so molecular biology, biochem, histology, the whole nine yards, you know, you have your anatomy first semester, you're in the anatomy lab every day of that semester. And I really, that first semester was the one I was most nervous about because, you know, this is medical school now. This is my dream and I want to do well. So it was intense. I mean, it was a lot of work, but becoming a biochemistry major and also my background in post back gave me sort of a boost. So my first semester was honestly the breeze. I mean, we were in class, basically you're in class every morning, Monday through Friday, from eight to about 1130 or noon. And you're taking three classes. And on top of the anatomy lab then, which is in the afternoon. And that's basically how all the semesters are set up. And then we have what are called block exams. So each block is about three to four weeks. The first two blocks are three weeks each last two blocks are four weeks each. And after each block, you are in at a computer sitting down, taking exams for these three classes in the same day within about three to four hours. So they had it set up. So like, honestly, you are preparing yourself mentally to take the USMLE and endure sitting through these brutal exams. Yeah. So they were all multiple choice. And You know, we did that. So basically, you have four blocks. You did all these exams. And then at the end, you have your final exams, which are sometimes cumulative. And you basically repeated this for the second, third, and fourth semesters. And then when the fifth semester came around, this is when we became more clinically oriented. But, you know, don't I don't want to leave out the fact that throughout the second, third, and fourth semesters, we also did take some clinical courses in the afternoon where we were, you know, well prepared to interview patients give the physical exam, the whole nine yards. So it was definitely a great introduction to that. But fifth semester was when we really got the nitty gritty on the clinical side, you know, on the island. And, you know, they continued preparing us for the physical exam, basically wrapped up everything. And we got basically pulled everything together from the basic sciences and prepared at the same time for the upcoming step one that we had to take in May. Did you have any kind of patient exposure during those first several semesters? During the clinical parts of each semester, we had standardized patients coming to the island. So we had the opportunity, you know, to interview them and expose ourselves to that. But our fifth semester, 
we were given the opportunity to go to either the different hospitals on St. Martin, and there's only two, but we've got to go to those hospitals or a couple different practices and follow doctors and observe them and interact with patients as well. Okay. All right. So you're all of your non-clinical years, you're on the island studying like any quote unquote normal med student would do. Right. And preparing for step one, basically, that's what the first two years are all about. And how do you think AUC prepared you for step one? I'll tell you what, people ask me this and I have nothing. I'm a very honest person. I have nothing but great things to say. We received, I received anyway, a phenomenal education. We had top-notch professors for the most part coming down from, some of them were coming down from prestigious schools in the U.S. to teach because who wouldn't want to come down to, to St. Martin, teach and get paid and have the whole island there to explore. But we were prepared wonderfully. Like I said, the exams, everything was oriented towards a step one. So when it came time for me to review and, you know, to actually take this exam, I went in there knowing that I knew what I was doing and was well prepared to take this exam. Okay. That's awesome. And you did well on it. Yes. Yes. Compared to the MCAT, I literally rocked the USMLE step one. Do you want to tell us what you got? 240. That's awesome. <laughs> so that's a, yes. a, a super competitive score for pretty much any residency that you want to go into. Yes. So that's great. Congratulations. Thanks so much. So let's talk about some of the negatives as you've gone through. And, and right now, we haven't really talked about it. Right now, you're a third year student. You're doing your clinical rotations. And we'll, we'll talk about that in a minute. But I want to talk about while you're back at the island, let's talk about the attrition rate at the Caribbean medical schools, because that's one of the biggest things that I think people talk about. And we've talked about it a little bit prior to recording. The fact that maybe these schools aren't selective enough in the students that they're choosing because a lot of people don't know that the Caribbean medical schools are for-profit medical schools and the large 95 plus percent, I I think it's more than that. I think there's only one or two for-profit U.S. schools, medical schools. So as a for-profit school, they're looking to increase their the number of students they have so they can get more money. But from a student perspective, were you seeing other students dropping like flies? What were you seeing on the island? So basically, I didn't, like I said, when I went onto the island, I didn't know what to expect. You know, we had 200 people starting out and I was wondering, you know, what was going to happen if we were all going to be together, moving on or whatever. And being at, in Philadelphia at that medical school for the post back program, I had mingled with other medical students there, and I had seen that not everybody has their heart in medicine, okay? But they're here for for whatever reason in medical school, whether they were pushed to do it or whatever. But I saw a lot of that, too, on the island. So there are a lot of similarities in that regard. So going through the semesters, I came across, I had friends who I thought to myself, wow, are these people really going to continue and become physicians? I mean, they don't seem to really have their heart and soul into this. But What were some of the reasons that Did you find out some of the reasons why they were there and and maybe shouldn't have been there? Parents pushed them was like, usually that was a huge factor. That was number one. Okay. That was usually a huge factor. Another factor was they just, yeah, you know, the money's there. Okay. Yeah. The money's there, but do you like doing this? Are you, do you want to practice medicine? This is my dream. I came down here to do what I have to do, get out and become what I want to be. Yeah. So the teachers and all the professors on the island they're not there to hurt us. They were all very helpful, always usually had an open door policy. So they were never out to get us. So basically it was your fault. If you ended up failing a class and repeating a semester, yeah, the school's getting another semester out of you Mm. in terms of money and stuff like that, but they're not purposely trying to fail you. Yeah. And we talked about this in session 45 about five reasons to go to medical school and five five reasons not to. So <laughs> if those those out there listening haven't heard that one, that's a good one to go listen to, number 45. So you did see some people fail and go back another semester. Were there students that just kind of threw up their hands and said, I'm done and, and left the island and didn't come back? Absolutely. Knew a lot of people that did that as well. Okay, so the first two semesters, once you got into the third, I mean, now you're in the nitty gritty, but the first two are sort of like, 
I guess you can call a weeding out because if you can't handle the workload in the first two semesters, lots of luck when it comes time to third, fourth, and fifth, and then tackling that USMLE. So yeah. a lot of them, yeah, they gave up first, second semester. I saw a handful of people leave. And what does that do to your psyche? You're sitting there trying to study, trying to learn as much as you can. And for those that aren't in medical school yet, you're kind of all comrades there together, fighting together, and you're, you're one big community. And then you see everybody leaving, or not everybody, but you, you're seeing people giving up and leaving. What does that do to you as a student, or were you able to kind of block it out? I mean, yeah, it's sad, you know, to see, pe- especially people you were closer with, and that happens to even the ones that were held back a semester. I mean, you're not on the same track with these people anymore. You know, they're going to be behind a semester, maybe two, and, you know, they're a couple months behind you, especially when you start clinicals, you know, they're still on the island. But yeah, like you said, I had to block that out. I was there for myself to do what I needed to do to get out. And that's exactly what I did. Oh, that's good. And obviously your step one score shows that you you did well. Let's go into your clinical years. The Caribbean medical schools, that's another one of those big challenges that the Caribbean medical schools have because they don't have that large medical center right there with them. And a lot of DO programs here in the States have that same problem. They're not affiliated with that large teaching hospital. And so students have to kind of spread out and go go where the work is, really. So what was that like, changing from being on an island and then kind of packing up and going to your clinical rotations? Well, it, first of all, it was great to come back to the United States. I mean, Did I have a fabulous time in St. Martin? Absolutely. And I made the most out of it. It's a beautiful island, so much to explore. But in terms of living, you know, it gets rocky every now and then. Your internet will go out. Your lights will go off. The water will go out. So, I mean, it's not a perfect kind of lifestyle, but it prepares you for what's to come. You know, and if you can live there, you can live anywhere. That's what I say anymore. But coming back to the U.S., yeah, like you said, we do not have a central teaching hospital. So, It does become an issue for some people in terms of where they want to pursue their clinical years. And luckily, we do have a handful of hospitals on the East Coast that we can choose from and, you know, hopefully complete most of our cores and electives. And basically what our school does is they do it by when you take the USMLE step one. So if you take it earlier, you know, you're going to have more options to choose from in terms of where you want to go. So if you want to go to New York, and you took that test early, you're most likely going to be in New York. We have a handful of hospitals there. Me, I saw Miami on that list, and I didn't even think twice after being in that gorgeous weather in St. Martin. I thought to myself, you know what, if I could do most of my cores and electives in Miami, absolutely, you know, I will definitely go there, with you know, without even thinking twice. And that's what I did. I took the USMLE relatively early compared to most of my other colleagues. And, you know, at the time we were having some problems with our contract with the Miami hospitals, but it all got resolved. And this is where I'm at. And it's, it's great. Are you going to be there for the, the majority of your clinical rotations? I'm hoping so. Okay. So let's wrap up and talk about some of the stigma with Caribbean medical schools. Now that you're on your clinical rotations, are you interacting with U.S. medical students? Yes. I just completed my psychiatry rotation. That was the first one. I started that in the beginning of October, I mean, September, and just ended that now uh, last week. And you are, you're interacting with people from University of Miami, a whole bunch of different schools here. And you know, I feel like you're getting the same kind of experience that other medical schools are getting. I mean, not every rotation is perfect, but that's expected. I mean, you're there to learn and you have to make the most out of it too. So whether you come home after these rotations and read up on things and study, that's making the most out of it. And if you're really into medicine and have your heart and soul into this, you will do that. Which everybody should be. (laughs) Right, exactly. But tell me about some of those interactions with the U.S. medical students. Are the attendings there, do they know that you're a Caribbean student? Do you see any kind of different treatment from the rest of the house staff, from anybody? Or or are you a medical student and everybody's a medical student and they don't care where you're from? You know, I've come across, you know, I perceive people like when I'm telling them where I go to school, first of all, I have no problem telling them. I'm very proud of where I came from. You know, it was a struggle to get there, but to medical school and I did, and I'm very proud of where I'm at. But when you do tell some people, cause they assume I go to university of Miami here now. 
So now when I tell them, oh, no, I'm at American University of the Caribbean, if it's an older doctor, yeah, I think right away, you know, bells are going off in their head and, you know, the doctors are thinking, okay, Caribbean student now, what kind of education did this person have? But, you know, believe it or not, and it's great, most of the doctors, we have a great reputation because they see that we know our stuff and we were trained well, you know, in terms of giving physical exams and interviewing patients. So, you know, a lot of the doctors are impressed. But yeah, I do feel like when I do tell people where I'm at school, some of them, you could just see, you could perceive there is that stigmatism attached to it. Okay. I don't want to say that it's to be expected, but it's to be expected. If there's even a, the stigma with DO students still, and so the DO world is fighting that. And so the Caribbean medical schools are all MD schools, but there will be that stigma. And I've worked with Caribbean medical student graduates before in my internship, and you can't tell. <laughs> there's, no, there's nothing that goes, oh, you're a Caribbean student or you're a Caribbean grad. It's just like there are good doctors and bad doctors. There are good medical students and bad medical students. And you will get out of your medical school, no matter where you go to, what you put into it. And it, just like you, you said earlier, if you, during your clinical rotations, are at the hospital working your tail off, you go home, you read about your patients, you put in that extra effort, you're going to be a great student, you're going to be a great physician. It doesn't matter where you went to medical school. And I can guarantee you that your patients aren't going to care that you went to a Caribbean medical school. I absolutely agree. You know what? If you have the personality and you know exactly what you're doing, and you can interact with people, and you love medicine, and this is what you want to do, I don't care, like you just said, I don't care where you went to school, you're going to succeed in the field. Yeah. But saying that, there are still some hurdles coming back and practicing in the States. Have you looked into that at all and applying to residencies as a Caribbean medical student? Oh, yeah. This is, I mean, it's very nerve wracking. You know, I'm not going to lie. Absolutely. We are coming from the Caribbean. We're going up against U.S. students who I'm assuming they have first priority. If they have the scores and meet all the criteria, of course, yeah, they're going to get the residencies they deserve or want or whatever. But if you're a hardworking student coming from a Caribbean school and you have a superb step one score, an excellent step two score, and you had excellent clinical rotations. I mean, I don't see how that should or why it should separate us from everybody else because we're learning the same stuff. It's not like we're any different, you know, in terms of education. So, yeah. Awesome. What are you interested in going into? So far, I've been leaning it towards internal medicine, although after my psychiatry rotation, I have been intrigued by that. So I'm definitely keeping an open mind and looking forward to the rest of my rotations. The number one advice as you go through your clinical years is keep an open mind and start every rotation with a thought of, do I see myself doing this as a career? You said it. So that's awesome. Jared, what kind of advice do you have for that pre-med student out there struggling with their MCAT and has maybe applied once or twice, has gotten rejected once or twice, and is eyeing the Caribbean schools? I'm glad you asked me that. You know, for anyone out there listening who's pre-med, please, please do yourself the favor of putting in as much time as you feel like you need for that MCAT. You want to blow that MCAT apart. It is the gatekeeper. Hashtag gatekeeper. <laughs> please. I'm not exaggerating at all. I was through it. I saw the mistake I made and I fixed that mistake when it came time for the USMLE step one. So please don't let that be the problem in terms of you getting into medical school. And if this is what you want to do, I tell people this all the time, whether it's medicine or not, live your dream. If this is your dream, you go ahead and do it. No one should stop you, whether it's a score or anything like that. Awesome. That was a motivational ending. <laughs> Absolutely. All right, folks, that was Jared Weinstock. You can find him on Twitter. That's how I found him. He's at Jared Weinstock. That's J E R E D W E I N S T O C K. And I'll have links to that in the show notes, which you can get at medicalschoolhq.net slash 51, as in episode 51. 
As always, I hope you continue the conversation with us. If you have any thoughts about the Caribbean medical schools, go ahead and head over to the show notes to the link I just gave you and leave a comment, leave a question, leave a suggestion, and let us know what you think about the Caribbean medical schools. Let us know if you're thinking about applying there, if you have any questions. This is just the beginning of the conversation that we want to open up about the Caribbean medical schools. I am not shy in saying that the Caribbean medical schools are not a first option for U.S. students. They should not be thought of as a first option. They should be, if all else fails, then they are an option. But there are some challenges, there are some hurdles, and we we talked about them a little bit today with Jared. So I hope you got some information out of it. And I hope it starts getting you thinking about uh, some other options that you may have. So until the next time, I hope you join us next time here at the medical school headquarters. 